nutrient conditions within these closed bottle systems. On top of that, we're also seeing changes in the light environment. So we go from uh, very optically clear conditions to very optically dense conditions. And so we end up with self-shading as our cell densities increase. So another issue that's really a problem if you're trying to look at ecophysiology. To overcome these issues, uh, some of the engineers at Embari have developed systems uh, that are known as photobioreactors. So these are really useful instruments that allow us to maintain very, um, very highly specialized uh, environmental conditions or very um, yeah, specialized environmental conditions where we can directly control things like temperature, irradiance, nutrient concentrations, and CO2. So this is ideal for ecophysiology. And on top of that, we're, add, we're able to add a number of different probes to look at different physiological measurements, such as oxygen consumption, uh, or production in this case, uh, changes in pH, or variable chlorophyll fluorescence, which is a useful metric for, uh, for productivity and understanding how the uh, photosynthesis is changing in response to our, uh, our uh, environmental stress. So using these systems, we want to look at how Micromonas komoda responded to elevated CO2 and specifically how it responded to elevated CO2 under different nutrient conditions. Essentially, are productivity rates affected by ocean acidification, and does this differ under different nutrient regimes? Um, so we've got a uh, diagram of our experimental design here. We're taking them from nitrate replete conditions into a transitional phase, where we're bringing them back to, uh, into uh, nitrate limiting conditions, and then back to replete. And on top of that, we're bringing them from ambient CO2 to elevated CO2 and back down and then repeating it under nitrate limiting conditions. Now, over this 70 day uh, time, peak, uh, time course, we're also measuring for the transcriptome and the proteome because we're really under, uh, interested in sort of the molecular underpinnings of how they cope with this environmental stress. However, there's also other things we can do with this combination of transcriptomics and proteomics. Within the field of biological oceanography, we are increasingly dependent on metatranscriptomics to understand biological uh, response to environmental conditions. And now, the, while this is a very promising uh, um, technique, it is dependent on some baseline uh, assumptions. That is, that what's going on at the transcriptomic level is what's going on at the level of protein or at the level of biology. And so experimental designs such as the ones that I've just uh, explained uh, are really useful for sort of checking this baseline assumption. Is there a good correlation between the transcriptome and the proteome? So starting with just some uh, basic physiology, I've got uh, growth rates up here. And not surprisingly, we see a reduction in growth rates as we move from replete nitrate conditions into limiting nitrate conditions. However, what we don't see is much of a change in response to uh, elevated CO2. We've got these little blips that occur at the uh, initial increase of CO2, but after that, once they acclimate, we really don't see much of a response. However, we do see a response in some of the, in some of the photopigments, specifically xanthophyll pigments, which are uh, pigments associated with uh, stress mitigation in these organisms. We see the ratio of xanthophyll pigments to chlorophyll change in response to ocean acidification, but also interacting with uh, nitrate limitation. And so that's what we're showing you down here. And we've got this increase in that ratio as we move from ambient to elevated CO2, but under nitrate replete conditions. Now, as we move to limiting nitrate replete conditions, we see that ratio increase even more. However, in this case, we don't really see much of a change in response to ocean acidification. So there's this interactive effect that we're seeing um, in response to CO2, but not, uh, perhaps not at the level of uh, primary productivity. So uh, we can also look at the proteome level, and that's what I'm showing you here. And uh, just walking, walking uh, everyone through this, uh, this heat map, uh, each one of these columns is the average of our biological quadruplicates. And uh, each, each column represents a different experimental day, and you can look at what that experimental day represents in terms of uh, uh, nitrate limitation in CO2 up here. So again, replete, limiting, and then our, our CO2 concentrations there. 
The, uh, each one of the rows is a different gene or protein, and the uh, color coordination there is uh, reflective of z-scores, which is sort of the, the standard deviation from the mean. And so these are organized into different uh, responses to our, uh, our treatments. So we've got four different responses. The red one here are proteins where we see an increase in their abundance as we move from nitrate replete to nitrate limiting. The green ones here are uh, proteins which decrease in abundance as we move from replete to limiting conditions. And then we have uh, perhaps more interesting clusters here, uh, the black one here at the bottom, where we have kind of a delayed response, where they're still decreasing in abundance as we move from uh, replete to limiting condition, but they're doing so over a longer time period. Then, of course, uh, the last cluster here in blue are proteins where they're very different under the transitional periods. So very high abundance as we transition from replete to uh, limiting nitrate, and then very low abundance as we uh, transition from limiting to uh, high abundance. So as I was mentioned before, we're interested in the uh, correlation between what's at the protein level and what's at the transcriptome level. And so we've done a lot of Pearson correlation between the, the protein and the transcript. As, of, uh, as I'm showing here, for a light harvesting protein, we see good correlation between the transcript and the protein. So we can do this with all these different proteins. And what I've done here is I've reorganized them into correlation uh, differences in the correlation with the transcript. So proteins that are highly positively correlated with the transcript are here. Uh, proteins that are not really very well correlated with the transcript are here. And then proteins where there is inverse correlation with the transcript are down here. So I've done this with each one of these different cluster groups. And then we can look for uh, different uh, functional groups within these clusters. So we can uh, look for enrichment of particular biological terms which is what we've got here. And so each one of these uh, bars represents a significant functional group that is found within each one of these clusters. So now we're sort of just going to cherry pick and just talk about a few of them, uh, starting with microtubule processes up here. And what this is showing is that microtubule, or genes associated with microtubule processes, or the cytoskeletal structure, are very well correlated and increasing as we, remove, as we move from replete to limiting nitrate conditions. In contrast, we've got this group down here, organonitrogen compounds, where we're seeing a reduction in these uh, proteins as we move from repeat to limiting conditions, but we're seeing an increase in them uh, at the transcriptome level. So inverse correlation that we're seeing there. And the take home message from this is as we move forward with metatranscriptomic studies within the for biological oceanography, we perhaps need to rethink how we utilize that information. It's still very valuable, but we perhaps need to identify specific molecular markers that have good correlation between a transcriptome and the proteome. And then we can utilize that to infer what's going on at the level of, uh, of biology. So just summing up what we've talked about so far, we're not really seeing much of a change in response to ocean acidification in, uh, at the level of productivity, primary productivity for our temperate strain Micromotus commoda. And this is different from what's been reported for uh, mesocosm experiments uh, as, uh, in response to elevated CO2. Now, the main difference with the mesocosm experiment is you're looking at the entire community. So that's the uh, grazers that are grazing on Micromonas, and that's uh, the heterotrophic bacteria that are perhaps interacting with uh, the different phytoplankton species. And the, the difference in our results here are perhaps, to, are perhaps indicating that the response we're seeing at the level of meso or the mesocosm experiments is the influence of CO2 on either the grazing community or the heterotrophic community and the relationship that has with Micromonas as, uh, as opposed to a direct response of CO2 on Micromonas. Now we've also done this exact same experiment with a uh, Arctic strain of Micromonas, Micromonas polaris, and we again see the same response. We really don't see much of a change in productivity associated with elevated CO2. So as I mentioned earlier, we're uh, able to match these uh, proteomic and transcriptomic analyses with high resolution physiological analyses. And one of the ones I wanna talk about is chlorophyll fluorescence. 
And this is useful because it tells us a lot about what's going on photochemically within the uh, cell. And so to explain this a little better, I'm going to take everyone back to that Z scheme uh, we remember from basic biology. And so this is, uh, this is basically explaining the flow of electrons through the photosynthetic apparatus. And so this starts with uh, the absorption of photons by light harvesting complexes, and then that transfer of energy to reaction centers, such as the PS2 reaction center here. And then that energy is utilized to strip electrons from a water molecule, and that electron is transferred through the photosynthetic apparatus and converted into chemical energy, which can then be used for the Calvin cycle uh, for carbon fixation. Now, uh, instruments like the fast repetition rate fluorometer allow us to probe this cycle using very high-intensity blue light. And this basically saturates this photosynthetic apparatus, and excess light from this is then emitted back out as fluorescence. And we can measure this increase or rise in fluorescence, and it can tell us quite a lot about what's going on photochemically. So today I'm just going to talk about photosynthetic efficiency of PS2, and we can think about this as the ratio of absorbed light that is then utilized for uh, photosynthesis. So we can do this in very high temporal resolution, essentially taking a measurement every minute. And uh, this is done throughout the entire 70-day experiment. So we have this very robust data set explaining what's going on photochemically within our, our uh, algae. So we're going to zoom in here to uh, a snapshot, a three-day snapshot over nitrate replete and ambient CO2 concentrations. The orange you're seeing here represents the mean plus or minus standard error for our biological quadruplicates. And then the black line there represents uh, the light protocol. So we're trying to mimic as, as a natural light protocol as possible. So uh, rise in, uh, in, uh, in radiance throughout the day to a midday peak, and then a gradual drop off after that. And so looking at the FE over FM, or photosynthetic efficiency, we see uh, it stays relatively high at night, and then drops down roughly mimicking or, or mirroring the, uh, the uh, light protocol. Now we can compare this to nitrate limiting conditions. And what we're really seeing here is, uh, the main difference we're seeing here is this much larger reduction in nighttime FE over FM. And this is indicative of a process known as chlororespiration, which is an important mechanism for uh, uh, stress mitigation in a lot of different algal types. And the importance there, or the, the thing I want to uh, drive home here is this is a mechanism we really wouldn't know about if we were measuring just single time points throughout the day. This is really only, we're really only able to capture this through this high resolution technique. So we can use the same technique to look at different light protocols. And uh, up here we have our, our photosynthetic efficiency and then our different light protocols. So we've got sort of the the natural light on a very cloudless day, sort of like today, and then we're comparing that to this sort of step function lighting, which is very common within uh, algal culturing techniques. And if we look at the photochemical trace, you can really tell right off the bat that these are very different from one another, and this is indicative of different photochemical processes occurring. So this is just to point out that as we uh, delve further into ecophysiology and experimental uh, algal culturing techniques, we really need to make sure that we understand how our light protocols are influencing our experiments. So everything I've been talking about so far in terms of variable fluorescence has really been about utilizing blue light to excite chlorophyll A. Now, photopigments or uh, algae have a number of different photopigments, and they all absorb light at different wavelengths. So we can potentially use different excitation wavelengths to preferentially excite different photopigments. And this can be really useful for characterizing the role of different photopigments throughout the day or in response to different stress responses. It can also potentially be useful within mixed community cultures where we have different species of algae that have different photopigments. And so we can preferentially excite photopigments in one species and preferentially preferentially excite photopigments in another species, to trace the photochemistry within both species simultaneously. So this is something that I was really interested uh, in doing in Adambari, and as a result, I designed and then uh, constructed a uh, multispectral fluorometer using open source hardware 
in software platforms like the Teensy, Arduino, and then uh, Python uh, for, for the coding. And so what I'm showing you here are the different excitation wavelengths that we use. So we've got a UV, a, a blue, a cyano, and a green wavelength. And then the uh, black line here is the, uh, the growth light we utilize, the growth light spectrum. And then down here, we have the absorbance trace for uh, the, the algae species that we were interested in. And what, you can, what I'm trying to show here is that our different excitation wavelengths are really focusing on different photopigments or different parts of that absorption spectra. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop with the, the photochemistry here. But if anybody has any interest in, in learning more about it, I do have slides that I'm happy to discuss uh, further later on. But the take home message from that is, the uh, utilization of these open source hardware and software platforms can really be very effective in uh, designing photophysiological or any kind of uh, physiological measurements. So this is something I've already done in the past for symbiotic algae within corals to uh, compare the photopigments across different species. And this is also something that other groups are using as well. So this, uh, for example, the OpenCTD is a group that is interested in using the same uh, microcontroller platform to uh, uh, look at temperature and, and uh, salinity gradients within the ocean. So a very useful tool for uh, developing hardware platforms at a low cost. So everything I've talked about so far has been focused on photosynthesis and molecular underpinnings of uh, the stress response in free living algae. And what I want to uh, show is that these same mechanisms are equally responsible on the reef. We have algae within these corals that are under the same, uh, the same stress, uh, stressors as we do see on the, on the uh, free living algae. So in this case, we're again looking at photosynthesis and utilizing many of the same tools. But in this case, we're looking at the flow of the energy rich photosynthate from the algae into the host uh, tissue layer. So for coral, corals is basically a very generic term that is uh, utilized to look at a particular class of cnidarians known as anthozoans. And while the anthozoans are very diverse, the ones that we're particularly interested in are the ones that calcify. These are known as sclerotinian corals. And these are important because they're the ones that are actually building these massive reef structures. And so uh, worldwide, there's roughly 800 species of calcifying coral. And adding to this diversity is a number of different symbiont types that we, uh, that we know about so far. And these are the symbiodiniums. Recently, they have been reclassified to uh, better project the massive evolutionary distances across some of these clades. So the clades are the different uh, colors uh, here. So the browns, the reds, the, the greens, the reds the purple and the yellow. So very much a massive biodiversity, both within the sclerotinian corals, but also within the symbiotic algae living within them. So for corals, the main thing we're really concerned about is elevated temperature. And this can have a very negative impact on the symbiosis. Essentially, it's causing a lot of oxidative damage within the symbiont but also within the host. And when that happens, the host tends to expel its symbiotic algae. And this is what uh, that bleaching term comes from. As the uh, symbiotic algae are expelled, they take all the pigmentation from the coral with it. it basically, corals are clear without the symbiotic algae, and that's where we see this, this bleaching down here. Now, once bleaching occurs, more often than not, the, the animal dies. And so this is a kind of an unfortunate picture here, but it does. Uh, describe the phenomenon pretty well. So this is from American Samoa, a healthy reef uh, of a, a crop red thicket uh, in December 2014. We then have a high temperature event, and two months later we have the bleaching phenomenon, and then six months later everything is dead and overgrown by macroalgae. So this can happen very quickly and affect large uh, areas of a reef. So on top of uh, thermal bleaching, ocean acidification is another area that we're really concerned about in terms of uh, coral reef uh, ecophysiology. And again, we have this uh, double-edged sword where uh, the symbiotic algae 
living in specialized vacuoles of the host tissue layer are dependent on host-derived carbon concentrating mechanisms to bring in that CO2 from the seawater into the uh, specialized vacuoles where the cells are. The host, on the other hand, is also concerned with carbonate chemistry. And in this case, it's because the pH level of the layer where calcification is occurring has to be maintained at a certain, uh, a certain pH level. And we're also, uh, we're also concerned about the uh, bicarbonate concentration within that level as well. So both systems are very, um, potentially very impacted by ocean acidification. Both ocean acidification and uh, high temperature have been well studied within uh, coral reefs. However, a lot of this research is derived from using only a handful of model systems. And so a lot of what I've uh, focused on during my PhD is looking at these symbioses across a number of different host symbiont combinations. Can we characterize the differences in these symbioses? And so for this kind of work, I've really focused on understanding the translocation of energy from the symbiont to the host. And so this is first tracing the flow of electrons through photosynthesis or photosynthetic apparatus and into carbon fixation and the transfer of that energy-rich photosynthate to the host, and then measuring the host response as well. And so this can be done using a number of different tools, such as chlorophyll fluorescence, which we mentioned already, and also a C14 labeling uh, using a photosynthetron or uh, other, other instruments as well. And then, of course, uh, lastly, we can separate the host and the symbiont to look at individual responses as well. So one of the experiments I want to talk about today is using these three species. Two of them, Pocillopora damicornis and Montipora hirsuta, represents Glaractinian corals, so ones that calcify. And then Discosoma pneumiform represents a non-calcifying species, which is very closely related to Scleractinia. And for these three species, I put them under a number of different experimental conditions. Ambient and elevated CO2 and ambient and elevated temperature. And I did that, I put them in these different regimes for roughly three weeks. So one of the other things that we always do during these experiments is we identify the symbiont type within them. And this is done by extracting the DNA and then amplifying the ITS region of the ribosomal array. These sequences, or these amplicons are then sequenced and compared to uh, previously published literature, or they can be compared within each other using denaturant gradient gel electrophoresis. And for this particular experiment, I just want to point out that each of these uh, symbiont types remain the same throughout the entire uh, three-week experiment. So the, uh, the symbiont types initially were the same as the, in, uh, the symbiont types at the end. So because I'm particularly interested in primary productivity, one of the things I wanted to do with this data set was compare the photosynthetic rates, in this, in this case uh, micrograms of carbon per cell per hour, with the density of symbionts within the host species. And what we found is that there's this interesting inverse correlation. As symbiont density decreases, net photosynthesis per cell increases. And this is likely associated with the fact that symbionts are carbon limited within the host environment. Now under high temperature events, the host is removing symbionts from, the, from their tissue layer. And remaining symbionts are potentially alleviated from this carbon limitation, and that's why we see this increase in that photosynthesis. So an important thing to con consider as we uh, look at uh, bleaching events. Of course, we can also look at each individual symbiosis uh, separately. And so here, we've uh, changed the colors to match the different symbiont types, or the different symbioses, and we're going to start with looking at Pocillopora damicornis. In this case, we're looking at the fraction of photosynthate uh, transferred from the host, from the symbiont into the host. And uh, we've got uh, our bar, our different bars here representing ambient and elevated CO2, and then the light and the dark represent ambient and elevated temperature. And for this particular symbiosis, roughly 40% of uh, photosynthate is transferred to the host. And what we're not seeing is much of change in this fraction under our different environmental conditions. For our other scleractinian coral, we see slightly higher rates of, uh, or slightly higher fraction of this photosynthate transferred. But again, we really don't see much of a change in response to our thermal or our CO2 conditions. 
However, in contrast, we see a much higher fraction of photosynthate transferred for our, uh, our non-sclerotinian coral, and this fraction increases under high temperature as well. So the take-home message here is that we have three very distinctive symbioses, and the differences in these symbioses can really have an impact on how they respond to environmental stress. So of course, seeing this in the lab is very different from seeing it in the field. And so I really wanted a chance to see if these experimentally driven hypotheses uh, can be observed through field-based observations. So I was lucky enough to work in uh, the island nation of Palau, which is just east of the Philippines. And this is an environment which is very unique in the sense that there's these massive restructures, and they're very, very diverse. So very diverse ecosystems across the, uh, this island chain. And two of these ecosystems that I want to particularly talk about are inshore versus offshore reefs. Now, inshore reefs are interesting because they have overall higher temperatures, they have lower pH values, uh, higher turbidity, and lower water movement than their offshore counterparts. Nevertheless, both systems are very productive, high coral cover, high diversity. And so this is really interesting for climate change scientists because inshore reefs are already reflective of the environment that we expect offshore uh, mid to late century according to the IPCC estimations. So they're already thriving under conditions that we expect to be very detrimental. Uh, nevertheless, there's lots of species there and they seem to be doing just fine. And uh, to sort of illustrate these two different environments, I've got these videos uh, that I'm borrowing from a colleague of mine, uh, Dusty Kemp at UAB. And we're first looking at offshore reefs, and we're seeing lots of productivity, lots of uh, high coral coverage. The uh, plating corals you're seeing everywhere are different acroporids. Uh, but the, the main things I want to point out are, are the species diversity, uh, very clear waters, uh, and then you can also uh, see some, uh, some of that water movement. So lots of water movement. And you can compare this to inshore reefs, where we, again, see lots of diversity, lots of high coral coverage. But uh, we can see that it's uh, far more turbid waters and uh, far more calm waters. You don't really hear as much, uh, well, much of that water movement as you did offshore. Now, one of the great things about this system is we find a lot of the same species in both locations. And so this is ideal for doing some comparative analyses. Uh, so we chose these four species, again, because they're found in both locations. We've got Acropora americata here in red, uh, Coelastria aspera in black, uh, Cyphastria chalcidicum in green, and Pachyceres rugosa in blue. And as we've done before, we first uh, identified the symbiont types within them. So first looking at inshore, all of the different coral species hosted the same symbiont type. Duristinium trenchi. Now, this is a particularly interesting symbiont because it's well known for being thermally tolerant. It's globally distributed as well, and it's uh, very uh, sort of at the forefront of, of research interest because of its thermal tolerance. In contrast, offshore, we see a number of different clade C or cladocopium species. These are uh, known for being far less thermally uh, tolerant or far more thermally sensitive than their uh, clade D counterparts. So we collected these species from both environments and fragment them into these little colonies, which we then placed on tiles and allowed to acclimate to uh, their environments for roughly two weeks. We then transferred them into our experimental system here and placed them under two different uh, treatment conditions. Control systems, where they uh, were maintained at a temperature of 27, 28 degrees. Uh, in treatment conditions where they were slowly ramped up to 32 degrees and then maintained there for 10 days. So first I want to show some of the differences between the inshore versus offshore populations. And so we're going to look at this figure first. The uh, different shapes represent the different coral species. The different colors, the light colors uh, represent uh, ambient temperature and the darker colors in both conditions represent the higher temperature. Uh, samples. On the x oh, sorry, on the y-axis, we have max photosynthetic, uh, photosynthetic efficiency of PS2, and on the x-axis, we have symbiont cell density. And both of these metrics are commonly used to describe the bleaching response. 
And the take-home message here is that while inshore we really don't see much separation between ambient and elevated CO2 samples, offshore there's this very large separation between the two, uh, the two conditions, which is what we would expect based on the symbionts within them. So we're already seeing a very different response between inshore and offshore corals to these high temperature events. And of course, uh, I also wanted to take this opportunity to uh, look at this correlation between net photosynthesis and symbiont cell density. And again, we see this inverse correlation. So this is potentially a really useful metric or useful phenomenon to keep in mind as we try to describe how a symbiosis responds to uh, thermal stress or, or other uh, potential stressors as well. Now, of course, again, we want to describe each individual symbiosis itself. So starting with inshore corals, uh, we have the heat map here represents different physiological parameters that are specific to the symbiont and not the host. So we're really just looking at symbiont physiology. And again, just keep in mind that all of these species are the same Durastinium trenchi. The only difference is the host environment they're in. So the heat map reflects the uh, full change response in, uh, in response to high temperature. So the, uh, for example, the uh, blue here represents a net increase in photosynthesis of Durastinium within the coral species Acropora mercata, whereas the deep uh, red here represents a net decrease in cell density in response to temperature for Durastinium and uh, C. aspera. And what I really want to show here is that despite these all being the same symbiont type, their response to temperature is very different, as you can, show, as you can see from the, the heat map. And so we've got the same species, but it really seems like the role of the host really impacts how they respond to environmental stress, in this case, uh, thermal stress. So we can contrast this to what we're seeing offshore. We have the same coral species, but in this case, they have different symbionts within them. So C21 in Acropora mercata, C3U in C. chalcidicum, and then C40 in the C. aspera in P. rugosa. Despite these very different symbioses, their response to thermal stress is very similar, as you can see from the, the heat map. Very, uh, very similar responses across the board. And so as we move forward in understanding thermal bleaching response, this is a key thing to keep in mind, is just how important the uh, symbiosis between the host and symbiont is, and, and how different these responses can be offshore versus inshore. So with that, um, I've spent a lot of my career so far studying coral physiology as a master's student and as a PhD student. And what I realized is that what I'm particularly interested in is photosynthesis and understanding those symbiont dynamics. These are very unique uh, phytoplankton as they're basically viewing the world through the lens of the host environment. So this is everything from their nutrient, to the nutrients they have available to them to the spectral quality of light they're seeing. And as I moved forward, I really realized that if I wanted to keep with this, I really wanted to get a more basic understanding of photosynthesis. And so I utilized an opportunity to work in Alexander Warden's lab to focus my uh, interest on free living algae. And this allowed me to, re uh, to learn new tools and new methodologies that I'm now going to, moving forward, apply to uh, coral physiology. And I've already gotten a chance to do this through work we're doing in Curaçao, which is uh, an island just north of Venezuela. Here we're looking at heterotrophy in different coral species. Now, we've been talking about the role symbionts play in transferring energy to the host uh, and how important that is for coral calcification. However, corals are also able to uh, consume uh, per, of heterotrophy. And most of what we know about coral heterotrophy is focused on consumption of zooplankton, so larger planktonic species. And this is mostly because we can see them, and so they're easy to quantify. But there's this huge picoplankton population, which represents a large carbon pool, that we really don't know much about how they interact with corals. So using uh, clearance rate techniques along with 16S amplicon sequencing and flow cytometry, we started looking at coral heterotrophy of these, or these picophytoplankton uh, populations. And what we found is there's some interesting selective side barriers within the uh, heterotrophic bacteria, the cyanobacteria, and picoeukaryotes. Essentially, 
heterotrophic bacteria doesn't seem to be consumed as much uh, across these species, which is particularly interesting because they are numerically the most abundant species uh, they come in contact with. However, we do see lots of uh, um, heterotrophy of pico eukaryotes, cyanobacteria, uh, and what's interesting about this is these uh, heterotrophic rates tend to change across these coral species and across these different, uh, different populations of Synecococcus and Prochlorococcus. So we're already gaining some new uh, insights into the role of heterotrophy of picoplankton, utilizing some or borrowing some of these techniques from the uh, biological oceanography. So moving forward with my research, uh, UA and DISL represents kind of an ideal fit for what I want to do. Uh, here on Dauphin Island, access to uh, seawater and experimental systems really would allow me to do some of the experimental research within the lab that can then generate new hypotheses, which I could then test uh, through field work in uh, the Florida Reef Tract and uh, Flower Gardens Reef in the, in the Gulf. And then through these field-based observations that can uh, generate new uh, research questions, which can then lead to new experimental techniques or, or analyses within the lab. Of course, part of this is instrument development. And as we uh, generate new research questions, we come up with new instruments that are of particular interest to us that can be both useful within the lab setting as well as uh, within the field. So one of the things that I really want to focus on is uh, the role of acclimation strategies across different symbiont uh, species. As we talked about before, there's quite a bit of evolutionary history or uh, differences across uh, uh, different symbiont clades. Specifically, clade A and clade B are separated by tens of millions of years of evolution. Now, both of these symbiont types are very common within the Caribbean. And on top of that, both of them are, are often found within the same coral species. So corals can either be specialists, where they only host a single symbiont type, or they can be generalists, where they can host several different symbiont types under different seasonal or different stress conditions. And Orbicella represents one of these species, which is a generalist. So this is kind of an ideal system to utilize different omic and physiological tools to identify specific markers of acclimation that can potentially differ across these symbiont types. So this is something that this area uh, and the resources at Dolphin Island and the proximity to uh, the different reef systems was kind of an ideal fit. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, before, I just want to acknowledge the uh, large group of people I've gotten the pleasure of working with throughout the years, both for the free living algae work as well as some of the coral symbiont work that I've done during my master's and my PhD. And so these two, figure, these two uh, pictures are from the different groups that, that I've been working with. So with that, thank you very much for your time.